particularly uh, grateful for the group that is um, sitting in the strong light, poor you, um, uh, next to me on the right. Why? Because at the Institute, we care about, you know, us as humans, where are we going, where are our societies going, um, from a social, from a political, from a human standpoint. And um, since we're here in Los Angeles, where stories are told, stories are made, and stories very much, I think, can um, shape the future, shape where humans, where politics, where society is going, um, to engage with storytellers beyond the story, meaning a story that has, in essence, a purpose, um, is really one of the things that Hollywood has produced, sometimes well, sometimes not. But having this discussion here is only too appropriate, and very appropriate at this time when I think there's change everywhere, there's change for sure, uh, in terms of politics, but there's also change in terms of who we might become as humans. So I think that more than ever, the ability to um, tell stories, the narratives that come out of Hollywood uh, can have an influence that is extraordinary um, here, but really all around the world. And that's, I think, the subject of tonight. And um, I'm delighted that you're here, and I'm especially grateful to um, the panelists. It so happens that Lawrence is an old friend of mine, so um, I have to thank him especially. Uh, but thank you in advance. Good evening, I'm Dr. Shiva Balagi. I'm the project director, a project director here at the Berger Institute. And I'm going to briefly introduce Don Nakagawa, who is the vice, executive vice president of the Berger Institute. And she was the brainchild of the series. Um, we were having a staff meeting at the Berger Institute and the way the staff meetings of the Berger Institute happen, there's practical institution building, nuts and bolts of how we're gonna develop programming mixed in with very philosophical conversations about the human condition. And Dawn in particular said, uh, she was talking about her Future of Democracy project, and she said, we need new stories, new stories that can help build um, a more optimistic, hopeful imagination for the future, that can bridge political divides. And you'll see from today's panel, Dawn, I've met many, many people throughout my career. I've taught at NYU, I've taught at Brown, I've met really, really brilliant people. But Dawn has the ability to combine practical with very, very complex, nuanced ideas, but she always wants to cut to the chase of how can ideas help us improve a tr an intransigent political or social issue. And so that's the impetus of today's panel, and I'm going to let her introduce the subject a little further. All right, thank you, Shiva. That was very kind of her. Now I should be blushing heavily, so <laughs> please forgive me. Um, so yeah, we're, we're at the Berggruen Institute, we talk about transformational change, and, and we really try to deepen our, our understanding of what's happening to us right now um, as a human community, and how do we adapt to those changes. In this particular conversation, we'll be talking about the power of narrative, and I hope this actually grows into a series of conversations about it, because I think narrative is sort of reestablishing its preeminent position in um, helping us interpret and understand our world. Historically, we've done this forever. Storytelling is written in the DNA of humans since we've been writing on caves or the millennia old oral traditions all the way up to the um, epic of Gilgamesh, which I think was the first written um, tale, and, and all the way up to today, we continue to tell stories, and we always have. For a brief period of time, um, we sort of turned to empiricism and the scientific method, and I believe that in this current era of the information age, we're sort of returning to narrative 
as the way to understand truth um, and reality. And there are pros and cons to that approach. And the reason why I believe that is because we're, we're sort of overwhelmed. Our cognitive capacity as, as humans at this stage is really overwhelmed. Um, where there's so much information coming at us and so much of it is contradictory that it's really hard for us to discern fact from fiction. For every fact, there's an alternative fact. Uh, for every research study, there seems to be a counter argument, another study that seems just as valid, arguing something that's the opposite. For every, um, you know, so-called, uh, you know, um, I don't know, version of reality, there's an alternate version of reality. And so what people are doing is they're returning to the only truth they can truly know, which is the truth of what they feel about something, the truth of what resonates with them. And narrative plays such a powerful role in that. So I believe narrative is coming back, and, and there are, as I said, pros and cons to that. Narrative does have the capacity of dist distorting reality. Um, and one could argue that maybe we don't, we, reality is a fallacy in itself, and that narrative is the best that we're ever going to have. But I think narrative is returning to this position in a different context, and we have to think about that carefully. And what I hope to explore with these incredible storytellers, really such an incredible panel, I am so excited to be sitting up here with these people, um, but is to explore the context in which narrative is returning to this space. And that is one that is largely and increasingly controlled by technology. Technology is determining um, what things we see, what things uh, we hear, what kinds of information we're exposed to and what we're not exposed to. Uh, algorithms are increasingly writing stories, it turns out, and some of the things that we're hearing um, uh, reported uh, to us are actually, it's not humans reporting them. And so I think that context does change quite significantly um, the, the, the position of narrative. So with these incredible storytellers, um, we're going to explore both um, the power of narrative, the continued power of narrative to address some of the social issues and, and the political divide that we're experiencing this, in this country, um, but also look at it through the lens of the context in which it is, um, it is playing out. And that is one that is very highly influenced by technology and the dynamics of the technology that, that have flooded, has flooded our lives. So I think I've said a mouthful. Um, so let's start with Lawrence. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Bender, I'm, I, I really don't need to introduce this man. If you are not uh, familiar with his work, you need to crawl out of that rock you've been living under <laughs> and go see some movies. Um, he wanted me to make the point that he is not an Academy Award winner, but his films have, I think, eight Academy Awards. So he's an incredibly accomplished Who's filmmaker. Counting? Who's <laughs> counting? Um, and he's been in this industry a long time. So, Lawrence, I wanted to start with you and sort of ask you to re reflect a little bit. You, your career has been a storied one. It's, I think, gone from a time where, you know, there was a more traditional Hollywood in terms of the way it operated. And we've moved into a new space where there are lots of distrib distribution platforms. There are, you know, a different social dynamic. Talk a little bit about how the industry and how your work has changed as a result of sort of the evolution and introduction of massive amounts of technology. Right, so first of all, I just wanna thank Nicholas personally. Um, I, I remember having dinner with Nicholas when he started this process of thinking about what he was gonna do and uh, in the early, early days of creating this and it's, it's come in a, lo a long way and it's an incredible what you've created with all these amazing people and Don. Thank you for the introduction. Um, at first, I have to say there are a lot of people I've seen in the audience since I, when I came in uh, that are storytellers. Uh, so there's a lot of people in the audience here that could be from Jason, who created TED Talks, to David Foster, who does music and tells stories with music, with Cal, who runs the Berkeley Institute, to, there's a, to Simon, who talks about, does it through art. So there are a lot of people in the audience here who uh, or it can be up here on the panel. <laughs> um, for me, um, I got to see firsthand how, um, how a movie can uh, inspire, educate, um, and help create a, a movement when I saw Al Gore do a slideshow uh, on global warming about a dozen years ago and had this crazy idea that we should make a movie out of it. Um, and, uh, and at that point, it was kind of a crazy idea. 
And if you could imagine going around saying, I want to make a movie with Al Gore. He had just lost the election. And, uh, and his slideshow about global warming. <laughs> and do you have a million dollars? And, um, you know, documentaries weren't so big then either. And, uh, but Jeff Skull uh, immediately popped for it. And, uh, and he was the sort of the, the god father behind that movie. But what was interesting was um, we made the movie very quickly. We got it out. And it exploded. But we had the choice even then. Uh, people were saying, you should put it on the internet. You should put it out there for free. Just put it on YouTube. Put it, you know, we're talking to Sergey and Larry at Google. And they were saying, just put it out there. Put it out there for free. But we believed um, that it would be stronger to put it in the movie theaters. Um, and oddly, everybody thought that it was, they called it a feathered fish. It wasn't a movie. It wasn't. It wasn't about this, it wasn't about that, and no one thought it was every major blah, blah, blah uh, said it wasn't a movie, and of course one person did. And, um, but what made that movie work was a combination of two things. And in storytelling, um, you need these two things. The most important thing was not the science, but the person. Um, and so when you're, do, when you're t telling a story, of course, um, it's really the person that you're interested in. Um, so when you watch a movie, you watch the plot, but without being interested in the character, um, you lose interest very quickly. And with this movie, uh, we had the slideshow, but we came up with the idea, actually Scott Burns did, of making it a combination of Al Gore's life and the movie. And it was that sort of brilliant stroke that the director, Davis Guggenheim, did so well with these interviews and figuring out the right, perfect balance of science and the tragedies he's gone through, whether it was the death of his sister, the loss of uh, the election, on and on and on. It was a beautiful story arc for a character. And it was the combination of those two things that ultimately, uh, I think, allowed it to be as powerful as it was. Uh, I guess the end of the, but the question basically was, how does it change today? And I still think, I still believe that um, putting movies in the movie theater um, even though the internet has such a vast change, has been changed in the last 10 years, uh, still has a great uh, way of exploding things to the world. And I, I think that um, even though I'm a 20th century guy living in the 21st century, I still believe that great storytelling and great movies still have great impact. Thank you. Um, Laura, I wanted to go to you. And um, you have a career that started and was. Basically, you were given birth to in this field as a result of some of the technology that was available at the time. And so talk a little bit about your history. Sure. Um, I got my start uh, making micro-budget independent films in New York. So it would be, uh, you know, a team of maybe five to eight people running around on the streets of New York City with a camera telling stories that otherwise would not be told. Um, and that was sort of where I fell in love with filmmaking. I also, I studied at the graduate film program at NYU. And while I was there, I wanted to learn how to do each and every little piece. So I learned how to record sound and I learned how to shoot and I learned, and I, and I just said yes to every opportunity and having, by in doing so, made two features that went to Sundance that were like the lowest budget films that I've ever screened at Sundance. <laughs> and uh, I shot a little web series called High Maintenance, which is now an HBO show. So, so just by, by saying yes and by, and by having found a craft that I love and finding the, the thing that I love to do, um, and because the technology was available at the time that I was starting out. I, I started out right when digital cameras were becoming a thing. And I remember seeing um, uh, that film, oh God, why can't I remember her name? This, uh, Rebecca Miller's film, Personal Velocity. And it was shot on a, a DVX camera, which is a consumer camera. You could buy it for $1,000 at the time. And I thought, wow, this woman, made a movie and it's incredibly personal and incredibly honest and it was shot on technology that is available to me. And that was when I said, I can make films. This is something I can actually do. So I am a product of, of the technology that was available to me at the time. So it has sort of democratized, I guess, the ability to make film. You, this, is the, this is the phrase that you used when we were talking. Um, 
how is that, I guess, how have you leveraged that? What kinds of stories uh, are you telling as a result of being able to insert yourself into this industry? Well, I started out basically making queer films because I'm a gay woman and that was sort of where I wanted to start. Those were the movies I wanted to make. Um, and then from that, I went to film school and uh, met Michael Showalter and I had made a short film in film school. In film school, I was sort of steering away from, from it, telling gay stories because I just was kind of tired of, the, of it because I'd done it all through my 20s. And so I, I met Michael Showalter and I had this short film called uh, Doris and the Intern. And it was about this older woman who has a crush on her, inter the intern in her office. And he saw it and he loved it and he said, you're funny, would you like to write something with me? And started write, sending him 10 pages a week and two years later we made Hello My Name Is Doris starring Sally Field. It was like <laughs> on set with Sally Field and she's like, showbiz, here we are, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and that's really what launched my career uh, as a filmmaker. So, um, yeah. telling stories about other people that ha you haven't seen before. Uh, so, hello, my name is Doris, is about an older woman. Um, Laura was telling me how hard it was to sort of pitch this film, and a lot of people said, no, she has to be younger, or she has to be cuter, or she has to be, and it was really hard to get it done, but of course, once it was done, they found somebody, they, they yeah. found a Jeff School. Yeah, nobody um, wanted to finance it. it. Um, and uh, they made it happen, um, and it ended up being a breakout success. So, telling stories of outsiders is something that technology has enabled. Um, Trayvon, I wanted to go to you and, and ask you to reflect on that. How has, I guess, you know, telling stories about outsiders, your own personal narrative is, is fascinating. I'd love for you to spend a little time talking about your history and your journey to where you are now. He's in an Emmy Award winning, if you haven't seen his Twitter feed, you have to see it. He won an Emmy, or I don't know, maybe you've won two, but at some point he decided two. to carry it everywhere. <laughs> He decided to carry it I everywhere hate him. he went. <laughs> he has pictures with both of them. It's terrible. <laughs> so, but um, what a phenomenal story you have. So talk a little bit, I guess, about your journey to where you are and how, I guess, storytelling, in a way, sort of freed you and enabled you um, to, to sort of come out and be who you are in the world. Um, I grew up in Compton in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I, if you know anything about Compton at that point in time, it was probably the most dangerous city in America uh, for many of those years. And I was a basketball player. Uh, I went to Dominguez High School. We were the number one team in the country. Uh, we won a national championship my freshman year of high school. Um, and all at the same time, while I was like going through an identity crisis of like understanding who I was as a bisexual man. And so at the time, growing up where I grew up, there was no conversation to be had around identity in that way. So it was a lot of self-exploration and, and, and trying to figure out like what anything even meant or, or what certain feelings even meant. And so for me, uh, steeped in a city full of gang violence, hyper-masculinity and, and sports, it was using those things, using the things that I had that I was good at, which is writing, which I had done since I was a little kid. I'd always been a, a writer, but I never thought of it as anything other than just a thing I liked doing. And it wasn't until college, or actually it wasn't until high school, when one of my English teachers pulled me aside after class and said, hey, you're really good at this. You should pay attention to this um, skill that you have. So after I went to college, I tore my meniscus in practice. I was out of, out of basketball for a year, and I started taking film classes and learning that I had such a unique story, life, background that I just never thought of in that way because I just lived it. It was just trying to survive. And in exploring that and realizing, like, well, basketball's not going to be a thing for me anymore, uh, I started doing stand-up. I still do stand-up. Uh, but I, I wanted to become a storyteller. I wanted to tell my story, I wanted to tell your story, I wanted to tell other people's stories. And so when I graduated college, I started doing stand-up until I got my first job uh, writing on The Daily Show in 2012. And I was always very passionate about politics, and so it was 
the, it was my dream job. It was the only job I wanted, and I got it on the first try. It was I was very lucky. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, that was if you watch The Daily Show, The Daily Show is taking uh, a narrative that we're fed by our government and by the world around us and deconstructing that narrative and, and figuring out what, where the truth lies in that narrative and, and, and how to make that palatable for people. And uh, you juxtapose that with the Colbert Report, which was uh, reconstructing a narrative, which was taking the day's news and telling you what it actually means in, in the same way you would see on maybe Fox News. And so for me, I, I became really enveloped in doing those things. How can I do, how can I tell stories? How can I write things that matter? How can I write things that, how can I bring myself to all of these experiences that I'm having now? How do I bring myself as the only black writer at The Daily Show uh, to this room and, and be whole in it and feel like I can speak up and I can have a voice? And it's very difficult for a lot of people. It was difficult for me in the beginning because you are alone and no one looks like you and no one thinks like you and you have to overcome a lot of those type of things. And so uh, it, in, in doing these things and like winning the first Emmy and, be, and having that validation as a writer, it, it made me realize that what I was doing was important, who I was was important enough to bring to this space and that uh, my story itself was important, which is then led to me selling uh, my sh a show to HBO, which was like basically based on my life, my dating life. Um, and so that became taking real narrative from my life that had never been seen before, because I had never seen anything on TV that looked or represented me. I'd never seen a character that told my story. I saw black stories, I saw the occasional queer story, I saw athlete stories, but I never saw anything like me. And I realized the only way that was gonna happen was I had to create it myself. And so I stepped up and wrote a, wrote a script and um, I sold it. And so that, for me, the power, in, at least in storytelling and the narrative, is I look at the messages I get from people on a daily basis who, who are, are people who feel so invisible and so left out of their community, whether especially it's pretty much all bi people, but like they don't fit in in the straight community, they don't fit in the gay community, and they they get shit from both sides. I'm sorry, can I say I don't know. Um, um, You're okay. Uh, and, and so like my inbox is just flooded with messages from people who are like, I can't wait to finally see something on TV that, that includes me, that tells my story and does it in a way that's not stereotypical or, or, or makes me like some type of like sex vixen or some type of like uh, a person who wants to like sleep with everybody. And so that was really important to me. And I feel like that, when you think about the way shows like Will and Grace move the country forward on gay rights and gay marriage, it's important to have storytelling that's diverse. It's important to have storytelling that, that has representation uh, because as the saying goes, you can't be it if you can't see it. And so seeing yourself, seeing things that represent you, it allows us to to tell stories that uh, that that use technology in that way, and that can get us to a place where we haven't been in, in places that we didn't even know existed, which is like places like my life. That's great. That's that's fantastic. Actually, this keeps emerging as a theme. So, as much as we see, I think a moment in time where you know, we're probably more divided, and there is more hyper targeting, and we are more fragmented. The, that is the cost of actually telling new stories, of, of, of a more inclusive, I think, um, narrative culture where people's voices and um, people's stories can be told in a way that they never could have in the past. Um, but it's not perfect, and actually I want to go to Devar. Devar is working on iVow, and I will let her explain what it is because I will do a poor job of it. But um, at its center is the idea of cultural narrative and inclusiveness as we move into an era where AI is going to be more and more and more relevant in the stories that are told. And communities that are currently invisible in our society or less visible may or may not be picked up in our artificial intelligence 
intelligence future unless we're very, very conscious of the way we're training AI. Because AI is just gonna mirror the society back to us, right? We're, we're, imp we're implementing it in lots of different systems across government bureaucracies, across education systems and so on. And we're training it on big data. Well, big data is rife with all the same problems we currently have in society, right? It's just basically historical data. So where there's prejudice, where there's bias, where there's invisibility, where there's inequality, it's going to assume that that's what, that's what society looks like. And we're finding lots of evidence of this. Well, I vow, I gather, is trying to rectify some of that. So please, Debar. Yeah, Explain absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so iVow is integrating identity and culture into AI-driven products. Uh, my background is I was at NPR News for 25 years. Uh, I started at KUNM in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, moved to Washington, D.C., and have produced most of the national public radio broadcasts you might have heard of, Morning Edition, Weekend Edition. Uh, I was responsible for writing Scott Simon's evaluations. Uh, I got the late Dan Shore on Twitter. I've been a journalist uh, for basically my entire adult career. Uh, I've traveled around the world, produced elaborate broadcasts from um, Baghdad to Kabul uh, to Rome. And uh, my last position at NPR News was the uh, senior producer of the Identity and Culture Unit. And as we went around the country doing stories around voting rights or uh, racial issues and education, um, I looked ahead at the future of automation and storytelling and I saw that the same kinds of issues that we're facing today with lack of inclusivity are going to be worse in the future of AI and automated stories. So in 2017, 850 stories that were in the Washington Post were written by a machine and not a journalist. The point is that Associated Press has been doing this for three years through Automated Insights Partnership where uh, many of their stories around sports, business, and weather are written by a machine. It's literally just a matter of years where our global stories are gonna be captured in automated news and the narrative is gonna be European-American. It's not going to include Trayvon and basically all of us, right, or different backgrounds. So uh, with iVow, it's a promise to uh, make the next generation of storytelling deeply inclusive. Um, we basically are taking different cultural references and adding metadata and tags to them around images so that when you look at AWS, which is Amazon's image recognition app, um, and you put a picture from St. Patrick's Day Parade, it can tell you with 90% accuracy that there's a kilt and a bagpipe in there. But if you put a Native American uh, festival in there, it actually thinks that the Native American headdress is a female. There is zero understanding in Amazon image recognition on festivals and traditions that make up who we are. So Google Home just approved our storytelling app. And let's say you're at a conference and your sister or your brother or daughter has to write an essay about American traditions. So you can walk into your kitchen and ask Google Home, hey, get me iVow. iVow is our storytelling app. And you can say, give me a story from a Native American tradition. And Google Home will play you the voice of a Native American Navajo woman speaking in Navajo. And so for the first 10 seconds, you're trying to understand like what's going on. And then she says her heritage. And she says, I am a Navajo woman. And what I just told you is that I'm an engineering student. And I believe that the future of cultural robots is what is going to save my culture and my language and identity. So the idea is that with iVow, we're bringing a completely new lens to storytelling through metadata and tagging in new ways to make sure that the future of storytelling is deeply inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. That's, That's going to be deep. an entire session. We're going to do something on that That's deep. for sure. Um, but I did want to bring this into the conversation to, to sort of, it's not just the technologies that today are defining the landscape in which we're receiving narrative, and it, that does have implications, which I want to explore in a second, but there is a next horizon to this, and unfortunately, it's not, it, it's happening now. That's right, so we're barely aware that it's happening, and yet in order to make sure that we don't hardwire into our systems everything that's wrong today, we need to be thinking about this now. So, um, so but I wanted to go back to, um, uh, to, to, to Trayvon for a minute, and you know, you're working on The Daily Show and working on, what was the other one? The, Full Frontal. Uh, oh right, Samantha B. I love them both, I adore them both, but, 
it does go to that idea of having a very fragmented um, media culture and fragmented society. Narrative has the power to really you know, make us empathize. It's one of the reasons why I think all of you got into storytelling, right? Because it compels people, it resonates, it drives change, or it can, like with Inconvenient Truth. But if, and I asked you this question earlier, and I want you to give them the same answer you told me, but um, one of my concerns is that that's fantastic, and we know there's this deep divide in the country, and narrative does have the power to heal, but with the technology challenges being what they are, we're not talking to the other side. We're talking to ourselves. We're living in a bubble where almost everybody who um, I'm you know, interacting with, and increasingly so, pretty much agrees with my opinions and my perspectives. Um, and so the divide's growing deeper and deeper. So if, um, you know, even if we create narratives that are able to heal that divide, the technology is preventing us from, from reaching them, right? And from bridging that divide. So, so how do we, I guess, how do we overcome that? Is that the goal? I think the, when you have, when you look at shows like Daily Show, Jon Stewart, Trevor, Full Frontal, like, yeah, they're, they're very left-leaning audiences and we very much are in some ways preaching to our choir. But uh, I think, uh, to steal from Peter McKesson, a friend of ours, uh, I think the idea is not to be concerned with uh, trying to convince people that there's a humanity in black people, humanity in gay people, humanity in women, a humanity in Muslims, a humanity in, in Latinos, and, and all the, the, uh, the things that go along with that in terms of legislation and how you govern and, and, and progress. I think the idea is to, to build the biggest choir. And if you build the biggest choir, then it, it's not about, uh, you think about the fact that like half the country didn't vote. And those people who didn't vote for whatever reason are waiting for a reason to choose a side. And by working on mobilizing and building the biggest choir, which technology is great for mobilization, you then put yourself in the position to build the largest coalition of people who believe in the humanity of gay people, of black people, of Muslim people, of Hispanic people, of women. And that allows you to be in a position to create laws and create spaces for people to, to exist and to progress. And so when I think about uh, mobilizing and choir building, I mean, you think about the fact that uh, just two years ago, there were 750 people outside this building, like marching that because yeah, because they, they felt strongly about something. They felt strongly about what was happening to their country. And that's what I think uh, is what I mean by choir building, by getting enough people to not spend time and energy trying to convince people of something they don't want to be convinced of. It's getting enough people to believe in the thing you want to believe in. Because when you don't, it's... it's they're mobilizing behind the ideas of separation and hate and, and race and, and all these things. And you can't sit back and just watch that happen. So I'm okay with us uh, every day going, John going out or Sam going out and preaching to the choir because I want that audience to be 20 million people. I want it to be 50 million people because when that number of people who share those progressive beliefs and, and who believe uh, that we all should exist in this country in a safe and in a safe way and be able to make a living, I think that the way you do it is through that mobilization, is through building that choir. And without that, I think that's why the phrasing exists. Like you need people to believe in something to actually accomplish something. Can I just add, yes. um, sort of in addition to that though, there's a, uh, this has been a kind of, an, in some ways, a very depressing year, of course. We all know the reasons why we're all depressed, <laughs> but, from a, in a positive note, the, um, if you think about what's happened the last year in the movie business, so Black Panther came out and did whatever, a billion dollars or whatever, it, you know, it changed the multiverse in terms of what uh, filmmakers can do in terms of just black actors. It's like everyone wants to make movies and TV shows uh, with black actors, which has never happened before. You know, when I've made movies in the 90s, you know, there's only, you can only make a movie with black actors if it was a comedy or it was like a Boys in the Hood kind of movie. And so that's changed 100%. Then Wonder Woman came out, and all of a sudden you have an Israeli woman is the lead of a billion-dollar franchise, which never happened before. 
and all of a sudden, women in movies are becoming stronger and stronger characters. Women director, just for the first time ever, there's a woman director on a Star Wars movie. She's the second unit director, a black woman. <laughs> then Crazy Rich Asians came out. And who's going to see a movie about a bunch of Asian people that no one knows? And everybody did. <laughs> and it's like, and no, you don't have to be Asian to see it. <laughs> you know, and so it's like, and the people in the middle of the country that... Um, that uh, maybe don't see these type of people all the time, all of a sudden they're in there, you know, they're watching those movies, because those movies did not make that kind of money with just the people who are the liberals, right? The red states people had to see those movies. So, and that's creating a whole wave. And so, yeah, we're, we, we got dire times, but in some ways, in the business of what we're doing, there's some real hope, uh, there's some real changes. And uh, I don't know if it's bringing anybody over yet, but I feel like it's, there is, some, there is a positive wave that is happening while all this other negativity is going on. What, what do you credit that with? Like, why is that happening now? Because it does seem like in the last year and a half, there's just been this steady flow of new, new kinds of narratives that are being, you know, that a large audiences are being exposed to. Why is that happening now? Well, uh, there's credit to be given to the people who are, you know, who are dealing with those very issues. You know, when the white, the um, Academy Awards a couple years ago, Academy Awards so white, whatever it was called, hashtag Oscar so white. And, uh, you know, we, we as Academy members were shamed, in a sense, by Oscar so white. And believe me, uh, the, uh, the people at the studios were, did not, you know, took that on. They were, they were shamed. When I was, um, uh, for many years on the executive branch of the, the executive board of the producers branch of the academy, and we were in charge of who we, who'd we let in. And I could tell you from the president of the academy, there was a very, very big push to bring in women, minorities, people of color, and so forth into the academy. So, um, uh, you know, whether it's gay rights, uh, you know, it's, it's the people who are standing up for themselves that are finally making some progress. And that's, you know, I think it's, that's why preaching to the choir is so important because those very people need to stand up for themselves and then other people will listen. And I think people want to see, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go oh yeah, I was gonna say, uh, it, it is fantastic what's been happening uh, in, in cinema. However, I think part of the reason why, because you said, uh, you know, it's so new, and yet what we're seeing are a lot of remakes and a lot of franchises which are, are based in uh, IP, intellectual property, that is, that is actually very old. And the only way to make it new is to change the people who, who are being depicted. And, and I think that we are actually in a culture that is entrenched in nostalgia right now, and I... And, uh, uh, you Make know, America great again. We, we, we can talk <laughs> about, <laughs> you know, but, and we can talk about what that means, but that, that, I just find that very interesting about, about what is happening right now. And if anyone needs a lesbian Marvel movie, I'm here to direct it. <laughs> <laughs> Soon on its way. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at, which is I think people want to see stories that reflect the world they live in now. Like, now that we have more... We have more choices on where we give our attention to because there's so many platforms. Now they have to compete for our eyeballs. And it's like, if you have a diverse group of friends, you want to see a world that looks like your world. If you uh, are a Haitian family, you want to see Haitian, you want to see the occasional Haitian story. Like you want to, like we can identify with anybody's story. Like good storytelling is good storytelling. Like I can watch any white movie and connect to it, because I'm a human. Like, there's emotions. Like, one of my favorite movies is Notting Hill. I'm not ashamed to admit that. <laughs> and it's a very because white you're movie. Gay. <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty much as white as it gets. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very white movie, but it's like, we've all been in love before. We all know, like, what the, like, it doesn't matter necessarily what the people look like telling the story. And for so long, we've accepted that when the story was all white. Now we need to get to a point where you can watch Crazy Rich Asians and still identify with the story no matter what the people look like or where they come from. And I think that's been the biggest swing. It's like they do every year they do these studies and the polls and they find that people want to see more diverse stories and they make more money. And then you find out that 
we made either the same number of them or less than we've made before. And you're, we're trying to figure out, like, well, what is the reason for that? And I think that's the work we have to do now, which is to get to the point where you don't have a year where 300 or 400 movies come out every year or however many movies come out, and, like, 95% of them are movies that are centered around white people and the world that they inhabit, and they don't look like the world we live in. I think that same thing should apply to our government. I mean, I think it's crazy that the House and the Senate is comprised of like a bunch of white guys. And why don't we have a uh, 50-50 uh, 50, 50 split of women and men in the Senate and the House? Why don't, why isn't that number comprised of more people of color uh, from various backgrounds? And I think when you apply that same thing to the studio system, you change the way TV and film, the landscape looks. People see it, and, and I think that visualization and actually seeing a world that's different, and I do credit to you know the diversification of media, the ability to peop of people like Laura to tell stories that wouldn't get told otherwise, mm -hmm. the ability to grab a camera and, and then to find your audience, and your audience's ability to find you. It right. has introduced brand new narratives, and I think the studios and, and Hollywood's starting to react to it, even if they have to be shamed into it, starting to react to the need for that and the desire and the market for those things. But Devar, I wanted to ask you, I mean, here we hear stories of like, we're making progress, right, of inclusivity. How do, how do you react to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's because the gatekeepers um, have, uh, for a long time, the new gatekeepers had put their heads down and worked really hard to prove themselves, and now we're emerging. I consider myself a new gatekeeper. Um, when I first was hired at National Public Radio, uh, my boss who hired me in 1994 said that many people at NPR said to him, why are you wasting your hire with her? You can't check a box with her. And that's because I'm not African American, I'm not Latino, and I'm not white, except I don't fit into a box. So they said that they wasted their hire with me, and I ended up being one of the most successful producers at NPR News in 20 years. So the gatekeepers, <laughs> yeah, the, we are the new gatekeepers, and we're not um, apologetic, we are smart, and we are there because we're, we're making opportunities for other people. The, the first people that I look to hire, they don't necessarily have to have the right resume. If I believe in them, I'm gonna hire them. I just hired a, a Navajo engineering student to be working with me on robots because I'm also executive editor of Hanson Robotics and I write character robots. And so I hired her and one of the directors was like, well, does she have uh, experience writing dialogue. I said, no, she's 22, we're gonna teach her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's yeah. the future. We have to, um, you know, uh, a lot of us have to just have a lot more confidence and know that we've proven ourselves. And when people open doors for us, because people like Lawrence who have opened doors, there were people who opened doors for me. And what, did you, what do you do? You're graceful, but you're confident. And you show to them that you know how to do it. And then you also study on your own. So I have four kids. My youngest is turning 20 on Sunday. And they are all self-learners. Many of them have learned about machine learning, et cetera, on YouTube. So I was like, I can do that. So I taught myself about artificial intelligence. And so now I've traveled around the world from Hong Kong to Dublin to, I just returned, you know, all around the world talking about artificial intelligence and culture, and it's self-taught. Because I said, I want to be also in the room in this new era. So encourage everybody that, you know, we now have an opportunity to shine, and, you know, there's, there's, um, there's no reason why people of color, women, can't take more positions of uh, decision making. So can, um, I, I need to open it up to q and I know I've been hogging all the I questions. I wanted to just but say yeah, one thing. It's, I think it's really important to note that Trayvon and I are the disruptors. We are not the norm in the industry. It, we're, it's, still, it's, it's still bad. I think 7% of directors are female, and I, I don't know what the percentage is for people of color. I mean, the percentage for people of color is so bad that the year Tyler Perry didn't work, it dropped by like 20%. <laughs> And that's not even a joke, that's a real number. By one person being going, it took up 20% of the market. So it's that bad. Not to, not Long to. Long way to go. go to <laughs> Long way to go. But let's open it up. Um, questions from the audience? Questions? Anybody? Don't be shy. Here. Hi. Yeah, my name is Ali from Lawrence. Thank yeah. you. 
I'm uh, proud to be an advisor to Iva. Um, I'm probably one of the only artificial intelligence data scientists in the room, so my question is from the other side of the house. It's about the word you use, which is disruption. I spent the past 15 years of my career disrupting every business I can, and some of the businesses are very easy to disrupt, but the human aspect of storytelling is not easy to penetrate. There is going to be some level of disruption, but it wouldn't be replacing the amazing stories you guys tell. My question to you guys was, how do you see the role of artificial intelligence as not a replacement, but an addition and empowerment to the way you guys tell stories? Question. Hey, do you wanna? I, I think there's an element of lived experience as humans that we'll always be able to bring to storytelling that a robot just won't be able to. I think you can feel it with as many algorithms and all kinds of things that you can figure out, but I think there's just something that will always be inherently human and inherently us about how we tell stories that once, if we get to a point where robots or AI starts writing half hour scripts or, or, or hour long dramas, I mean, I feel like you'll, eventually over time you'll see there's a pattern. You'll see there's the, the, the missing element is the essence of like that human experience. When you go into a writer's room and when we're breaking stories, a lot of what uh, comes out of those stories, a lot of what you see on the screen is literally us taking from our own lives and that makes up a lot of the narrative stuff that happens on a character level or like why this person made this decision and how do we justify that and it was like, well, that's what happened to me. And so that's a real human thing that happened and I can tell you what that felt like and I can tell you all the things about that that go along with my lived experience. So I think, I hope that there's a ceiling when it comes to AI and storytelling because I don't want to learn a new trade. L listen, you're talking to a bunch of filmmakers and we're never going to say, oh, yeah, that's right around the corner. <laughs> put us out of a job. <laughs> but, um, but however, you know, at the TED conference this year, uh, they showed a, um, uh, this extraordinary computer-generated artist. And it was super scary because it put in all the Impressionist paintings that exist and put in all their paintings. And a few thousand, whatever they are. And, um, and it created its own Impressionistic paintings. And they were extraordinary. Uh, and it just kept going. It kept going and going and going. And the entire audience was just like with their mouths open, like, wow. And it was like they created a new Miro, a new Van Gogh, a new, uh, you know, it was so amazing. And so <laughs> it was kind of scary. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope Trayvon is right, but, I, you know, this, this, uh, we're, we're in a different age, and so it's hard to, it's hard to really know what's going to happen. If a, if a computer can... Um, if a computer can win in Go, that means it's learning to think a different way. It's not a, it's not a powering through a linear method. It's, it's learning to think nonlinearly. You know, it's hard to know where that's going to go, but I feel, like, I feel like that's something that could happen. And it could know that it, doesn't, it shouldn't repeat a pattern. It could know that it, could, it needs to do the, not to do the things you're talking about. So I don't think we're there, but I think there's a future where that could be. Yeah, um, I promise I didn't make him ask that question, <laughs> but I actually have two really quick things I want to say. So um, I was recently, a, a year ago this month, in Tonga. Tonga is in the South Pacific. Tonga does not have a written history. They only have oral history. And the kids are not learning their history and their tradition because a lot of uh, glorification of Western culture has got into the South Pacific and they've forgotten their own ways. So one of the questions we were asking is that, could it be that a machine could be fed the oral history of Tonga, and over time, for the machine to be able to replicate stories from those traditions? So you might think that's odd, except an MIT graduate did exactly that. His name is Wolfgang Victor Yarlett, and you guys have to look him up. So he's currently getting his PhD at Florida International University, but he's from the Crow tribe, Native American tribe. And he went to MIT. MIT has something called the Genesis Story System, which creates stories by machines. It's been uh, uh, fed Shakespeare and Mark Twain, and that's how it learns to have character. So this particular guy, Wolfgang, said to his professor, what if I was able to prove that the Genesis story system can learn about the Crow literature. Let me try. And he's like, okay, do that for your master's theory thesis. So all he did 
was enter 100 pieces of data, oral stories, text, essays, photos of the Crow tribe to this machine, and he was able to prove that the Genesis story system could replicate Crow literature. That is revolutionary. For languages that are dying, for languages that in cultures around the world, there are 90 countries in the world that are the least developed countries. What does that mean? That means they do not have a voice. In which case, machines could be a remarkable opportunity to have their narrative be told in the future. Okay, over here. and for um, uh, filmmakers and other artists and musicians, you know, there is this thing that happens when you are creating that is like a sort of like an aha moment, you know, like the lightning strikes and it comes through you and you have no control over it. And that's part of being human. That is something that happens and it's out of your control. And I just know this from experience when I'm painting, I have no control over it. It's, I'm not a religious person, but I definitely feel that it is a moment where that's what comes out of me. And so I think that it's very interesting, the idea of having AI communicating, being able for education, you know, to support these environments or these groups of individuals who are losing touch with their histories. But I don't think that it could ever replace that experience. And I don't know if that's something you agree with. I 100% agree. I think they, you said it, Don. You said you have to feel a story so that they say a story is not a good story, is not seen, read, or heard. It's felt. Okay. Can we, in artificial intelligence, tell a story that is felt? If we do it right, we can, but it falls in the category of beneficial AI. Stephen Hawking said, you have to pause. We're not there yet, but we need you, and we need you, and you, and you, and everyone here to make it happen. So I agree with you right now, it's inconceivable to think that that would happen, but I think it is the responsibility of us humans who are creative, who are from a multiplicity of backgrounds to come to the table to be part of that, because it's going to happen. And so let us at least help shape it. Okay, another question? Oh. <laughs> um, sorry, should I go? Okay. Um, my question was about IVAL as well. Um, how do you protect against bias? So like, say for example, um, you're, uh, you know, hearing from a Native American tribe. Um, how do you protect against, uh, you know, um, uh, an imbalance in representation amongst the Native American tribes and all the various cultures and people that you're representing. Yeah, absolutely. So we're an early stage startup, so we haven't, um, that I don't have that answer for you, except I'll say that I was just in Dublin, Ireland at a QA um, conference, quality <laughs> assurance testers, and they're looking at testers being the front line of artificial intelligence because they're the bridge between the user. So the idea, Lawrence, that you would produce a film, but then imagine if AI is involved, you would actually have the tester with you there who would be representing the public. <coughs> and the testers of the future, the machine testers of the future have to have multicultural background. So we're not there yet, except obviously we have to make sure that we put in the right ethical procedures so that whatever we're representing is um, comes from different vantage points. And it's gonna take a lot more than iVal. One of my favorite scary stories is um, Google put together a team to look at bias in the algorithm and the entire team was white men between the ages of 20 and 30. And they didn't see a problem with that. <laughs> so say that uh, gatekeepers have had their head down for a very long time and that's very true about Hollywood. Uh, we're also at a time that like people want to hear more stories and there have been successes. But something, we can celebrate things, but something that happened this year that was, I think, negative is that Sundance, which has been a gatekeeper for voices, this year had the most amount of uh, people of color filmmakers and female filmmakers and it sold the least. And it doesn't, 
actually correlate that it that's because it, that's who it was being made by, but the industry is scared of buying films there because they're not getting Oscar nominations like they used to, and when you drop 10 million, it's much harder to make that back. So if the gatekeepers are behind, and they, the pipeline that they've used for a very long time is maybe drying up, how, how do you identify what is a new pipeline, or how do you train the gatekeepers to look elsewhere, because they're probably not gonna find the uh, next Coen Brothers or Alison Anders at Sundance, perhaps, for the prices. You know, you know the thing is this, is that film festivals uh, over time have had uh, lots of ebbs and flows. So that problem with Sundance, but if you look at South by Southwest, that's expanding and it's like blowing up in terms of how big that is. And they have uh, very small movies. Um, Toronto has gone through a big change. This year, Toronto uh, had many movies that were brought in by distributors and ones that were not there to be bought by distributors. Um, uh, Americans are not so interested in bringing movies to Cannes this year. There's every, every, there's like waves of uh, this with, with so I, I would not be uh, so worried that Sundance this year was a problem. Uh, sometimes things don't sell. Sometimes it's a terrible year at Sundance, nothing sold or, Oh, it was a great year, like a year before everything sold. <laughs> so it's like it's, um, I don't know if that's a particular um, marker showing like a trend. I don't know if that's a trend, but uh, I guess you have some I have things to say about So I'm <laughs> from the independent <laughs> film world, and there is, a, there is a crisis <laughs> in distribution. And that crisis is partly because um, all of the streaming streamers, no one took streaming seriously. And then all the streamers came along, and now they are the studios. And so there's this great book called The Big Picture. You should read it. Uh, but it's all about what's happening in Hollywood right now. And, and I worry for independent film. I really do, for truly independent film. But I think you have, you have great, because basically, so Amazon and Netflix have started studios, so they're no longer going to festivals and buying films. So a lot of those films are dying on the vine, or they end up later, you know, I have a film called Fits and Starts. It, it premiered at South by Southwest in 2016. It was a, a micro-budget film. It was my first, my directorial debut because I knew that after co-writing a feature film that did extraordinarily well, no one would take me seriously as a director in Hollywood. So I went back to New York and for $100,000, I made a, an independent film. And I'm very proud of the film. You can watch it on Amazon, um, but, the distribution marketplace for a film about an interracial couple that is not about them being an interracial couple is not great. So we have to really, I, I really think there is a distribution crisis and I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> um, and, and, and I worry for young filmmakers who are just starting out how are they going to, because every year at Sundance one or two films becomes, you know, the, the uh, yeah, it, the what's the what's that film this year? The uh, sorry to bother you. It's a great film, but that was the film that broke through, and it's and it's truly fresh and it's truly new and it's exciting. Um, but in order for more films like that to get made and for investors to get a return on their investment, like something needs to happen. I don't know what that is. I I pose it to you guys. <laughs> I think we have time for like one more question because we've gone over, but you know, they're here and they're awesome. So, um, I, okay, so I'll, I'll ask. Um, I, you mentioned Space Marriage Asians and, um, and Black Panther, both of which I think were fantastic and they did well just because they're really good and good things do well. But I feel like those movies are also very segregated the world is not just all Asian people or just all black people. And I feel like I understand we're in this moment that those movies should have been made <laughs> years ago. So we're having to catch up, but that doesn't look like this room and it doesn't look like the world when I walk down the street in Los Angeles. And I'm just curious how you guys feel like we move through this moment into the moment where we actually see this room reflected when will on the film screen. catch up with reality yeah. right. I, don't, I don't i would i would push back against that i think one wakanda is a fictional place that exists in the real world with white people 
Uh, I mean, Wakanda, the, uh, <laughs> the last Avengers movie ended in Wakanda, and the whole movie took place everywhere else in the world, and all the white characters descended on Wakanda and basically destroyed it, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't, I, think, I don't think you need to move through Black Panther or Crazy Rich Asians because, I mean, do I need to move through every white movie I've seen my entire life that was all white people? It's, the, it's I mean, but I, don't, but I don't think that can exist. I think there can be movies that have a primarily white cast because that's someone's reality, that's someone's experience, that's the story they want to tell. We want to get to a point where the Black Panther movie is not a standout because it's a Black Panther movie. It's just a movie that was good, that was made, that happened to have a mostly black cast. And I think for, and, and Lawrence, you probably can speak to this as well, I think the the place well, we I'm want- I'm about to make an all black Western yeah, so Exactly. I'm so I mean- the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but like, the even, I mean, you think, you think about Hamilton, it's like normalizing the idea that people of color can be anything. I have a friend who's shooting a period drama in London right now with an all black and Asian cast, and there were people who pushed back against it. We were like, a, a black person can't be this character. And she said, yes, they absolutely can, and now they're shooting her movie. And so it, it doesn't, it's not, I wouldn't call that segregated, I would call that a movie with a mostly black cast or a movie with a mostly Asian cast. I mean, Kevin Kwan wrote a really beautiful, brilliant story, and it got made into a movie. And so in the, on the literature side, you wouldn't necessarily say, well, why would someone make a book that's so full of crazy rich Asians? I mean, it's a story about a particular place and a particular time and a particular type of people, and I think it's okay for that to exist. But I mean, you look at the history of TV and cinema, and I mean, for 90% of its existence, for white people, TV was a mirror, and for everyone else, it was a wall. We were watching you live your experience. We were watching your story be told over and over and over and over and over again until someone finally let us in. And so it, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think like a year where you have two blockbuster movies uh, of primarily uh, non-white cast members, I don't think that's a signifier of like, we're starting to segregate Hollywood. It's just like, hey, look, people want to see themselves on screen. Like black people wanted to see Black Panther because it was finally a character who, who was positive, who, who wasn't connected to anything negative and, and who like lived in the richest country in the world and like had the most valuable element on the planet and wanted to rebuild, like that's what we connected to. And I think that is the next level is seeing a reflection of yourself that's not Boys in the Hood, that you don't have to go and make that movie. The white people connected it to it too in the exactly. Asian, so that's what's so wonderful about and, it. And and it, it goes, yeah, earlier, like what I was saying, like you can connect to a story because it's a good story. It doesn't matter what color the person is living that experience. <laughs> so I sit there in the bedroom, I watch him change the skin. Guy with this suit, black guy, weird looking guys, <laughs> girls sometimes, crazy shit. So we're talking about what things look like, but I think we need to talk about what things think like. And the left is in danger of being regressive in sort of, let's say I'm a Trump supporter, hypothetically speaking, <laughs> and I'm a gay black man who doesn't believe in abortion. And I think, from my point of view, there's a diversity in culture that we're, we're, we're going for, but there's a regressive movement to a lack of diversity of ideas and the complexity of ideas with which people live their lives. I think this is, is, a, is a danger that we um, are in front of today. I agree. Thoughts? Is that, I don't hear the question. The, I, mean, I mean, it's just, it's just you know, we talk about identity. Agree or disagree? We, we, we're talking about identity and, uh, we're talking about identity and color and Asians. Yeah. And we're talking about yeah. what yeah. things I, look like. We, we need to sort of look under the hood and examine what things think like. Well, I, just, mean, I, 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 
Okay, yes. Yeah, I definitely, I agree. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I, no, I think you're, you're 100% right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's clearly, uh, well, I mean, look, in, in, in the black uh, world, to be gay is maybe not the easiest thing because there's, in the Latin world, to be gay is not necessarily the easiest thing because there's a culture of uh, religion that says that. So there's absolutely, you know, Trayvon is a anomaly, maybe not anomaly, but a unicorn. A, <laughs> no, but it's just term. in the world that he lives, you know, to grow up in Compton as a bisexual person, he would have been shot if they found out. I mean, that, that's just not a thing that you would want people to know. So it's, uh, and luckily, <laughs> he's here <laughs> with us. I so, kept it a secret long enough. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, so yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, uh, we, are, we are all a mixture of many things. Um, and there's, and that's, we're seeing that in the polling. We're seeing that now with uh, all groups of people don't, are not going one direction in terms of what, where we're heading into the polls. So you're right. Yeah, it's the, I think it's the double-edged sword of being diverse, which is like you get so diverse that then you start to almost go back the other way where you like start saying this is how you do the diverse, this is how you do the... Oh, you mean Black Panther's not diverse? Black Panther, Black Panther is, is, it's the same corporate set of values that you see in white films except with black characters. So that empowers black people, but it represents the same value system. I mean, it's basically saying like, hey look, black people deserve to be corporate as too. Like that's like the same, like you get, you, it's an equal opportunity but, <laughs> to but be. <laughs> but there are underlying values that need to be challenged. As sure. opposed to like, let's just put black people or Asians or. Here we're just or, or, or we're talking about one movie. So we're the changing. idea, <laughs> the thing is, we have lots of these things, lots of movies about white people. So you can choose, you can't choose like one movie about a white person and say, you know, there's one big blockbuster with black people. So now, you know, over time, we'll see what other movies come out. I'm making a movie that's all black Western. It's got nothing to do with Wakanda. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> all right. We're going to close it there. But I want to thank these panelists. Thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. Um, And uh, I want to thank Nicholas Bergruen um, because he's our host and um, he's a very gracious host. So thank you.